Thank you for being here to talk about philosophy of mathematics and logic. There is not normally a bestseller, but I'll try. When, when they asked me to talk about my work, the title, I gave this title, but probably I was too optimist how to speak about the unspeakable. I really wanted to explain you how to speak of the unspeakable, but that was clearly pretentious. So I really changed the content of, of the talk. And I will try at least to explain you the title. So I'll get to the end of the talk to explain you the title of my talk. So um, it's, it's a different talk. It's, it's, I, I won't use slides. It's just about ideas. So I will start with a question that is kind of the question, with capital T, of philosophy of mathematics. That is what mathematics is about. Um, it might seem like a very technical and strange question that nobody really cares about, but the point is that mathematics is ubiquitous in our life. Like when we share the bill at the end of the night or where we try to understand how our, our cell phone works, and most of the talks we saw today use a lot of mathematics, actually. So the question is how, what, what mathematics is about. Um, well, the, 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 this question is not so only interesting for the philosophy of mathematics, but for philosophy in general, in the sense that it goes directly to the heart of two of the major problems of philosophy that are existence and truth, in the sense that Mathematical knowledge is a limited case of both existence and truth, in the sense that it's hard to think about something more reliable than mathematics, in the sense that what we know about mathematics is true in a very strong sense. And the object of mathematics, like the number two, is very, um, it exists in a very, very uh, thin way. So it's a limit case in the negative way about existence and in the positive way about truth. So it's, it's interesting to understand what mathematics is about, to understand what you think about existence and truth. There, is more of the, um, there are some of the more important, important questions in philosophy in general since the antiquities. So, um, normally when you try to understand uh, this question, you, you might try to just sit and think about the question, have a very theoretical attitude, and try to understand what mathematics is about. Well, I, I won't ask you to do this today because a lot of sharp minds right, already did it for us. And it's interesting to see that normally the answer to this question following two major categories, they are normally called um, Realism and nominalism. I won't give you too many details about what these positions are, but I just want to give you a rough idea of these two very big positions. Um, there's a lot of nuances in, uh, in the philosophy of mathematics, and of course it's uh, a big reduction to say that it's, there's just um, realism and nominalism, but it gives you an idea of how the debate is. So realism is a position that think that mathematical object exists in a, just in a different way. They exist like chairs, like people, but just in a different way, not in this world, but in an outer world. So the point of this position is that mathematical objects are independent of us. They are there somewhere. Nobody knows exactly where, because where is not the right question for these mathematical objects. But they exist. And so um, the problem exists of existence is solved. They exist as um, physical objects, just in a different way. But, but then the problem is, how do we know them as long as they are independent from us? Well, this is, this is a problem of this position because there's an obvious tension between the ontology, what exists, and the epistemology, how we know what we know. So um, realism, has the advantage of explaining very well the question about existence, but has the problem of making very mysterious our mathematical knowledge. So on the other hand, um, nominalism is the position according to which mathematical objects are just creation of our minds. It seems reasonable, and, but, and, and this actually explains very well 
um, actually explains very well what uh, uh, we know about mathematics as long as it's a creation of our mind. But the problem is how do we know that these objects that are a creation of, of our minds are so stable that our mathematical truth is so objective that we can always rely on that. So here we see, we see that the problem, the epistemological problem is kind of solved about the truth of mathematics we know, uh, or sorry, about the existence of mathematics. Because we know what mathematics is about because it's just a creation of our mind. But it's hard to explain why we know so objectively what we know. So this, these are the major positions in the philosophy of mathematics with respect to truth and existence of mathematical objects. But then you see that there is always a tension between truth and existence that is hardly resolved by neither of them. So um, a completely different perspective that I would like to present to you is one that takes into consideration what mathematicians do. Because what mathematics is about can be understood also as what really uh, they do, these strange animals. There are mathematicians that work in their uh, offices, but we don't really understand what they are working on. So uh, if you um, have this perspective, then you can try to understand what mathematics is about, understanding the history of mathematics, for example, what they did so far, mathematicians. And this um, possible perspective on, on mathematics is very interesting, also because it, um, it makes so uh, important the position we are in the history of mathematics, at least in the, in the last 200 years. In the sense that mathematics till the 19, until the 19th century was a science of magnitudes, understood as uh, things you use to measure, to count, uh, to um, confront uh, numbers or uh, regional spaces in geometry. And that was a very uh, um, reality-driven uh, understanding of mathematics. But then in the 19th century, something happened that, is, that really shaped, reshaped completely mathematics. And the, the, um, what happened was the infinity started to be studied in a very actual sense by mathematicians. In the sense that infinity became one of the main notion of mathematics. So um, it became so important, the study of infinity, that at some point um, a mathematician called Georg Cantor tried to build a theory of infinity, a mathematical theory with axiom, theorems, proofs. And what happened, not, not, just, not just a philosophical perspective, even though he had a very strong one. But what happened, it, what he discovered, is that when you start studying infinite in mathematics, you uh, understand there's not just one kind of infinite, but many kind of infinities. And this is, was, were, was quite astonishing, because um, he could show mathematically with a proof that different collection of mathematical objects, both infinite, has different cardinalities. And that was a, was a major advance and, and one that made um, understandable a lot of the use of infinity in uh, mathematics so far. So, um, and so now I get to the title of the, of the talk, How to Speak of the Unspeakable. The point is that um, doing mathematics as any human activity is an activity that use language. We use language to communicate ideas, to write proofs. So uh, the point is that we can think about a sentence, a, sen a sentence that explain an idea, or that define a concept, or that define an object, a mathematical object. The point is that the, the collection of all possible sentences we may uh, have in our languages, whatever language it is, is infinite, fair enough, because we can always uh, say a sentence that has never been spoken before. But this infinity is much, much smaller than the infinity of the collection of all possible mathematical objects. 
And here is, here is the point. The point is that nowadays mathematics is about uh, speaking about object for which we don't have all words to name them. In the sense that there are too many objects in our mathematics, as um, uh, Hamlet would have said about philosophy, than words we have to describe them. And this is the point why mathematics is speaking about the unspeakable. Because you can speak in general about what mathematics is about, but you cannot have a word for every single mathematical object. And so this is my uh, attempt to explain you the, how mysterious and wonderful is mathematics and the philosophy of mathematics and how, um, in some sense, doing mathematics and thinking about mathematics is a way to speak of the unspeakable. Thank you very much.